Welcome to the My Tech Tool Belt Podcast. We're your hosts. I'm Shannon. And I'm Brenda. And this is a podcast where we highlight educators who innovate, engage, and inspire through the use of technology. Thank you so much for joining us today for episode 33 of the My Tech Tool Belt Podcast. Hi, this is Brenda Argano. Today, we are so excited to meet with Nicole Johnson, a principal from Los Angeles, California. Nicole had the amazing opportunity to travel to Finland and observe how their school system is set up. Nicole shares with us what she witnessed with the school culture, most notably, trust. She also tells us about how they structure their day and shares with us what changes she has already brought to her school after her trip, and more that she wants to implement very soon. She is Shannon and I very interested in making the trip to Finland, so we hope you get as excited as well. So, without further ado, our interview with Nicole Johnson. Okay, today on the MyTech Tool Belt podcast, we are excited to have Nicole Johnson in our studio Nicole's the principal at St. Aloysius Gonzaga School in Los Angeles. Yes. And um, she's going to be talking to us today about a recent adventure that she just took. Yes, yeah, very um, exciting. And the cool stuff that's going on at her school and the cool stuff that she saw on this adventure. So welcome, Nicole. Yes, Thank welcome. you. Yeah. Thank you. So will you just kick us off a little bit about telling telling our listeners about kind of your journey to becoming a principal and the teaching that you've done and just mm-hmm. your experiences? Sure. Um, so I originally didn't have the intention of getting into education. My my uh, background was theater and I wanted to go into special effects makeup, which <laughs> obviously went in a much different direction than that. <laughs> um, I, I was a nanny during college for a special needs boy and a neighbor of his was a teacher at St. Aloysius School upon graduation said, um, you should look into, into teaching. You're great with kids. And so I was later hired as the third grade teacher at St. Aloysius. That was in 2002. And served as a third grade teacher for about five years and then went off to maternity leave. And while on maternity leave after having twins, was asked to come back as principal. So I turned down the offer five or six times, <laughs> <laughs> knowing what it would involve, especially having newborn twins at home. And then I was given the opportunity to work from home two days a week and work in the school three days a week so I could be home with my girls. So that's what won me over. So I took that position and have now been in that position for 11 years as principal. So I've been at my, all of my education experience has been with St. Aloysius school. So I've been there all, going on 17 years. Wow. That's wow. cool. That's yeah. an interesting journey. It is <laughs> much different than what I had expected. I was actually offered a job on an Alicia Silverstone television show right after college, but it was making minimum wage. And I just paid for myself through college and thought I didn't work that hard to make minimum wage. <laughs> you right. know? So, so this, this teacher job was as low as I was paid at the time. I felt like it was, you know, tons and tons of money compared to my minimum wage job offer. So right. yeah. it was a good, it was a good move. It was a good move. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I've had the opportunity to work with your school for probably three or four years mm-hmm. now. And your school has kind of come to us at the university as part of a, a part of a pilot program mm-hmm. and, a, and a blended learning initiative. But you had an opportunity two weeks ago. Uh, two weeks ago. Yes. We just returned two weeks ago. To go to Finland. Correct. And inspired by the Teach for Finland book mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. looking for new ways to bring what Finland is doing, which I am excited to hear about because mm-hmm. I've, even though we have talked, we have not talked about that. So I have no Correct. idea what, what you're bringing back. But like, I'm curious to, um, to hear kind of how that, that opportunity came about and then what that experience was. So, so how did that opportunity come about? So, well, just myself, I've always been really interested in what they've been doing and keeping track of the PISA scores over the past, you know, six, seven years and just seeing that they consistently have done so well and have outperformed, especially the United States. And so I, on my own, started doing research on what they were doing and trying to bring some of those skills into my own school and some of those concepts into my school. And then about a year ago, the Archdiocese of Los Angeles sent out an email Um, just stating that they were giving the opportunity for people to apply for this grant to join other archdiocesan principals uh, for a week-long trip to Finland just to kind of explore their schools and uh, their curriculum and to see what we could bring back to our own schools. So so I applied for this grant thinking that it was minimal chance I would be selected because I assumed there were so many others that were selected. And then um, last June, I was notified that I was one of, there's 12 of us, chosen so that I was informed I was one of 12. So I was really excited. So 
there was myself and then 11 other archdiocesan principals. I was the only archdiocesan principal representing um, kind of an inner city school. So, you know, there was, there was some feedback that people thought that it wouldn't translate because we're just totally different demographically from who the, the schools are serving in, in Finland. But it, that was totally untrue. There was so much that we brought back that we could inst- instill our own students and in our school and so many exciting ideas. And just they're very innovative in the way that they're doing things there. Cool. Did you know any of these principles already? I didn't. That was something that was a bit scary at the beginning because the, the very first meeting there was there were some groups of principals who already knew one another, and I was I had seen some of them even having been a principal now for twelve years, I'd seen them around but didn't know any of the principals. We it w- ended up being a great group. We had so much fun together, and we w- were the way that you know teachers have their little core group. It's nice now to have this core group of principals. It's someone else to lean on that might be going through the same kind of problems you're going through, and we're texting every day, numerous times a day. I think we all miss each other, but we <laughs> became very close over that that course of the week. And they sent principals not only from elementary schools, but also high schools. Correct. So you got yeah. you got to meet and kind of see, like some of your kids may matriculate into some of these other high schools mm-hmm. or just similar high schools. Yeah. So Yeah, correct. I, they tried to get, in representing all different areas of, of the diocese in Southern California, they tried to get principals from all other areas who had varying uh, demographics. So it would... Some, we could each take something back different for our community. That's perfect. And did you have any prep or anything before you went? We did. So we had about five meetings where well, we had our book that we focused on, the Teach Like Finland, and then several other research documents that we focused on. And then we met about five or six times together as a group just to come together closer and discuss the way we were going to approach this visit. And so we kind of joined in a pair and we would we'd focus on different areas. So some... Pairs focused on curriculum, some focused on the role of the administrator, some focused on collaboration. Myself and my teammate, we focused on just the general school day. Um, so that way, when we were there, we knew specifically to look for those items. And then we'd, we would have our day exploring these schools um, and learning about the curriculum. And then we would have a debrief session in the evenings, and we would kind of write up what we, what we saw and what we felt like we could bring back to the archdiocese. Very smart. I love that. That's a great... Great way to, to form and have everybody have specific goals. Yes, it was a great design. There, there's three gentlemen uh, principals who are the, the leadership team, and they did a great job outlining the visit and, and making sure that it was everything we did was purposeful. And so what did you find? Like, what was the day like? It was interesting. In all the research we did, there was what we saw and took back with us was so much more than what we read and all the things that we've heard about. So everything we've heard about about Finland – you know, we saw there was um, just so much innovation in the way that they're doing things with their students, varied schedules, a lot of autonomy, the students, parents, the, um, you know, the teachers, there's a lot of that collaboration, but there's so much autonomy within that as well. So there was a lot of differences from their school to our schools. Trust was the main thing that I think if you asked any of the principals in our group that went, that was the main, the one word that we would use to describe everything we saw was that there was so much trust. The teachers had trust in their students. The parents had trust in the teachers. The parents had trust in their own children. They just trust the system as a whole. And so that was something that we just, we were inspired by. Just an example, you know, we would be, we'd be exploring a school and we would just see kids by themselves in the hallway, or we were in another one school and we saw kids in the library by themselves and we're looking around for the adult because, you know, in the Archdiocese of LA, like that's a big no, no, you don't leave your kids unattended. And obviously things are very different in Finland. It's safe, it's safe environment. But we'd see kids by themselves. And what typically has happened is in a classroom, the teacher assigns the students a lesson. And then the kids go out and they, they complete it in an environment that, where they're most comfortable. It might be in class. It might be laying on the floor in the hallway. It may be in this little alcove area in the corner of the, of the hallway. It may be in the library. maybe downstairs. They just kind of let them go and they're free to, to complete their work and they come back when they're done. Um, so it was just very interesting. It was, that was a little nerve wracking to get used to at first, as especially as an administrator. But the kids didn't take advantage of it, you know. And because I they, because they knew they were trusted, they didn't take advantage that they don't want to lose that trust. Right. So that was a big thing that we took back the autonomy. I mean, there's a, cl- a lot of collaboration, and so here we're very much heavy. We focus heavy on PDs, and there it's much more informal. The ki- their teachers are collaborating, but it's more, you know, in the teacher's lounge or in the hallway or they're stopping each other on the stairs. So they do work together and support one another, but it's not as 
scripted as, as how we do it here. The principal, we asked, you know, how often do you get in? We're told as principals to get into the classroom, like at least once a week, you should be in, you got to do your walkthroughs. And they thought, well, maybe once, twice, we're thinking once, twice a month, a year. Wow. That's how often they get into the classrooms. They're not dictating to their teachers how they should be doing things, the kind of plans that they should follow. They just trust that their teachers have been trained properly and that they, they're there to do their best job and that everyone just trusts one another to get the job done. There's that um, idea about the homework. That's something else, you know, I thought, oh, I'm, I'm really interested to look into that because you hear everyone talk about that Finland has no homework, which is not true. The kids have homework, just much less homework. It's not busy work. It's something that supports what they're doing in class. But the max amount of homework we saw, even for someone in, let's say, ninth grade, was 30 minutes. Wow. So that was interesting. Um, that's something that I feel that we could definitely bring back. And then also the idea of the more time for them to be kids. So it's in law, the law that for every 45 minutes of instruction, there has to be 15 minutes of active play. They could either do that or do 90 minutes of instruction and 30 minutes of active play. And so that's something too that we could easily bring back. My job in looking at the general school day was I wanted to watch these kids who are in these big, heavy snow boots and snow suits get outside and return in 15 minutes. I just thought there's no way this it ha could happen, <laughs> but it does. They know that that's their precious time. So they get out of the class, they get their snow boots and snow outfits on, get outside, get their energy out, come back in, they're back in. It was more, uh, you know, around 15 to 20 minutes, but they're back in and working. And they're more productive because of it, because they got their energy out. Right. They don't believe in detention. They don't believe in benching, any of that. They want the kids to be active as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have their playgrounds, but then they also have... So maybe something that at once in the spring is a table. It's now snow covered in snow. So the kids use it as a, um, they sled. <laughs> they sled. <laughs> so you'll just see the kids um, they, with their sleds out there. And they're still playing basketball and football, and but everything's just covered in snow. And then... They talk about a lot about their forest schools. And so not every school has that ability to go and be in the forest, but there's trees everywhere. So one of the particular schools we went to, their backyard literally was a forest. Their playground was in the forest. So they don't do any formal education at all until age seven. So there is education. There's early childhood education, but there's no, they don't teach reading any formal education until at least age seven because of the brain development. So the younger kids at this particular school and a lot of schools that have this kind of location, they're outside. They do forest school. So they're out there for four hours and they're just all bundled up. And we got to watch them coming back. One of the days a teacher had um, spikes in her shoes <laughs> for hiking out to the snow. And they go out and they learn about botany and they take bark and they explore it. And I mean, they're just learning about um, socializing and working with the students in their class. And it's just very different obviously than what our kindergarten looks like. They have little huts out there too for the really cold days where they have a fireplace and the kids sit around and they learn inside these little huts. But that was a very interesting concept to take back. And then another thing that we didn't read about was the amount of, um, they call it hobbies or their skills. So one third of their curriculum is skills-based. So basically it's all vocational. So they're, the kids are doing woodworking, uh, metalwork, electrical, sewing, cooking, so every single student from four, I believe it was fourth grade and up is doing that. And that's a third of their curriculum. So mm -hmm. they're, they're very self-sufficient. So, you know, we met one boy and he said, yeah, I, you know, I snowboard and I wanted a ramp. So he built it in metal shop. And so you see little 10 year old, nine year old kids with these pretty heavy machinery, which that was worrisome for us. But as a parent, you're like, mm. yeah, you know, <laughs> you see them with these big tools and saws and, but they, they just, they, they've been using it and that they're, again, they're trusted to use them properly and. Right. And they're trained. Mm -hmm. Right. They're trained. Yes. They're trained to do so. And they, you know, they have their 3D printers and just what they were. And that was consistent in all the schools. So we saw schools that were very different financial levels, but their biggest thing there is, equ is equity. They want, no matter where the school is, no matter the, the financial means of the student, it's all public school system. So they, every school has, the kids have equal access to the same thing. So some buildings may be newer and nicer than others, but at the more low income school, they still have a beautiful woodworking studio and metalworking studio and electrical. It just, I, you know, it, it was nice to think that these kids, when they get older, they're just, they can rely on themselves to fix something or, mm -hmm. right. Cause these kids are building their own radios and they're built, they're wiring their own lamps. I mean, it, it was amazing to see cool that. actual life skills. Yes. Yeah. That's, and you know, really nice. it's really going back to what we used to have in school. I mean, when, when I was in high school, we had shop and ceramics and we had all of those. Right. Those things where they were more of an elective. These kids are required to take it. Not and, so smart. Yeah, it is. And they do and they do it for about three hours a week in that one skill that they're focusing on at that time. And then they do language minimum of two hours a week. 
So how many languages are they? So they learning? teach, they obviously learn Finnish first, and then whatever their mother tongue is, so if their mother tongue is German, Italian, whatever it might be, that's the second language they learn, no matter what it is. And then they learn English. So most kids by, let's say, age 10 are fluent in three languages. So they all tend to learn English, but they really want to respect their mother tongue and also their um, mother religion, which we found was really interesting. So whatever the religion of that child is, even though it's a public school system, let's say it's Judaism. If they have two kids in the school and they don't have any any teachers who can teach that, they skip in a teacher, let's say from Northern Finland, who is able to teach that for that lesson. That's how they receive their uh, Judaism lesson or wow. Catholic religion or whatever it might be. Interesting. It was really interesting. So they really respect the heritage of their children. That's amazing. Yeah, I love that. That's awesome. So how long is your day? I mean, obviously, they're learning a lot in one day. So what is it their... It varies. That was the other interesting thing. I, most of the younger kids are done by 1, one thirty. So they, they, and they, and they, some start at eight, some start at nine, some start at 10, depending on what classes they're taking. But the younger kids are more scripted. Their schedule is more scripted. So they're there usually until about one, one thirty. Um, the longest day for any of the students was, you know, the eighth, ninth graders, and they usually go until three, three or three thirty. but a lot of them don't even start until 10. It's, it's very similar to a high school schedule or college schedule where they pick the courses that they're taking. And then, um, and then they build their schedule based on that. And there's even, and then when they go into high school, there's two tracks. So they go either to the the ed side or the vocation side. So they can choose which track that they want to go into. At what point do they do that? Uh, they go into elementary goes until ninth grade. And so when they get to 10th grade, that's considered high school. And that's three, that's usually three years, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah. Do that. And so they choose that track and that again is free education and it, so is college. And so they're, no matter what, if they feel that they're going to go into a, a vocation and not so much the, the ed side of it. They're supported in any direction that they choose to go. And some kids choose to go to a specific school if they have a specific vocational school that they want to attend and it may be outside of their area where they live. Those kids are paid to um, live uh, on their own in an apartment, even as a 10th grader. Jeez. And the government funds it and they can live closer to their school of choice. And do they consider that high school? That's, yes. That's high school. <laughs> yeah, totally different system. But there are a lot of things we felt that these vocational skills that we could bring that back to our school. Obviously we at my inner city school, I can't have this fancy woodworking lab, but there are things we can do. We can bring back sewing and cooking and, and just teach these kids skills that they need that a lot of our, our students unfortunately are losing. And we felt we could bring back this, giving the kids more time to play, lessening the amount of homework that they have so they can just be kids, you know, which a lot of our kids unfortunately are losing out on that time. We want them to be able to have time to do sports and to be active and to be with their family Right, absolutely. Like I remember, like even looking at preschools for my kids and seeing there's, you know, there's such a high demand for academic mm -hmm. academic preschool, and and so the the preschool that we ended up with actually had like the kids were nailing stuff in wood, and like mm -hmm. that's what I want. I don't want it all to be academics. I want it to be a well rounded program. Yeah, and I think I I would love to have see more of that in our public schools and in private schools. Here. I think it all unfortunately comes down to funding, but there's ways to, I, within my own school, we've had to be very um, creative in the way that, that we fund things. And, but, but I have so many families or parents within my school system that can teach our kids to cook or with sewing. We felt, okay, instead of sewing and having to have that cost of the sewing machine, let's start with knitting. Right. Mm -hmm. or, or just hand, or hand sewing. Yes. Hemming, right? Mm -hmm. That's just a life skill, another exactly. life skill that everyone needs to. Yeah. Have. And we're going to make sure the way I plan to do it with my students is, you know, they'll take like a, a trimester focusing on one skill and then, and then the kids will kind of just swap between that. Maybe from fifth grade and up, we'll start there. So it's going to be creative, um, you know, <laughs> at first trying to implement these things, but the homework, we already somewhat did implement that. Um, this year. And so in speaking with my middle school math teacher, she was a bit worried that she's, we're not preparing our students for high school because in high school, they're going to be inundated with homework. And so she's still, she's still giving her students homework, but what we're going to, we're going to start is this whole trust system that the homework is going to extend upon what was taught in class during that day. And if the kids really feel that they got it, then we trust in their judgment that they don't need to do the homework. If they feel that they need a little bit more support, then they'll do their homework. And so we're not going to be checking nonstop and penalizing the students for not doing their homework. We're just, it's at, by middle school, we're teaching them to become mature and, and what, to be able to make that judgment of whether or not they feel that it's necessary, but we're not going to have them sit there for two hours 
doing these math problems, and especially those who already got it in the class, there's no need for that. Right. How do we get to a more lowered amount of time in the classroom like they are? Like, what what is it that's holding us back? I think, you know, there was such a heavy focus on getting these these time allotments and, and making sure that you're you're teaching exactly the right amount of minutes for math and science social studies. And we had that as well with the Archdiocese of LA. We've kind of fallen away from that in the past few years. The Archdiocese have. We haven't had to focus as much there. And I think what's starting to hopefully happen here is just more of a focus on the content. As long as you're really – the time that those kids are in class, there's no time wasted. There's no downtime. They're in there and they're working and they're learning for every minute of the day that they're in there. And so, um, and that's kind of what we're doing at my school already. So we have our days Monday through Thursday. Those are our heavy core curriculum days. So our, we have 90 minute rotations and that's similar to what they do in Finland. And the students are really working hard in those 90 minutes. And, and our integration of blended learning in our school has really helped us to do that, to keep them focused. Um, and then we have our one day of electives. So all those things that used to take away from the curriculum on the other days where we used to have art here and PE here. Now we put that all in one day. So the teachers know Monday through Thursday, they really got to get through that that core curriculum and um, and use their time wisely. And then we had that one day a week of electives where the kids are doing their art and music and Spanish and PE and those things. So that's a just, it's just valuing the time of the students while they're there and making the most of that time. Are they doing any um, cross-curricular? In other words, where it's it's not just you're learning math yeah. and then in the next period Tons. you're learning science. So it's, it's like coding holistic. is done in math. Okay. So we, we talked about that. So yeah, their coding is done. That's a math course. So yeah, the language that's done as like an ELA course. Mm -hmm. So that's something I thought, okay, well to make up for the time in ELA, we can, you know, have a 90 minute session and have 45 minutes of ELA and 45 minutes of Spanish. Mm -hmm. So yeah, tons of cross-curricular. Tons of project-based learning. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of, obviously, there's a lot of hands-on in, in what they're doing. There's a lot, there, there is a lot of tech integration. They're trying to, be, they're not as advanced as they'd hope. So that's something that they're, they're trying to work on. But you do see it, that the kids are just very tech savvy just as kids. And so they're integrating tech in that way. We did, we saw some ninth graders presenting and doing um, like Google Slides. And, and so there is some tech integration, not as much as I think you see here. Um, so you don't see kids on iPads and tablets all the time, um, but that's but they're working towards that. They want they want to integrate more technology into their curriculum. They've articulated that that's that's something that they see as correct important. Yes, that's interesting. So, but they don't want it to take away too much of of that that hands on curriculum that they have. They still that's why it's in their curriculum that they have to one third of their curriculum has to be these vocational skills. I think that's awesome, and the kids enjoy it. Yeah, I hate that that uh, that it's not here. Like I hate that we're not teaching them how to mm -hmm. sew and hammer and build and you know nobody wants to be a plumber but if there were no plumbers oh absolutely yeah. who would exactly like who would plumb our houses yeah. like we need we need these people and to, it's to, and i like too that there's no gender roles that you see the boys are in and they're not embarrassed by it. the boys are in there sewing their pants and they're they one of the boys we saw was sewing these tie-dyed pants and went into the bathroom and changed and came out all excited that he had made these pants for himself there's no clearly defined gender roles. I mean, with same with the cooking classes, like they're in their cooking and they, the students have different roles. So the teacher would assign them different numbers, one through four, let's say, and one person was the cooking, one would set the table, one would clean. So they would cook for their group and then they would actually set the table and they'd sit down and they'd eat together as a group. And then at the end of that lesson, the kitchen was pristine. They were in charge of cleaning everything up, putting dishes away, starting the dishwasher, everything. And then we asked... Some of the kids, you know, is this traditional? Do you do this with their family? Yeah. And it was kind of, she looked at me like it was an odd question. Yeah. Like, <laughs> of course we do. Of course we do. And so, no, every family they eat at four, that's traditional time. So, the, the so even the work day of the adults is less. So, the seven hours and 10 minutes. Wow. And so, um, they're home, but they're home by four o'clock. And you said they're hiring in Finland right yes. now. Okay. I'm just checking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We all wanted to move after that visit. But um, so all the families, they, they, they actually don't go out to eat much in Finland. The, the Finnish go out to eat when it's a special occasion because it's, for them, traditionally, they just are at home together with their family and they sit at the table together and eat dinner every night. That's great. It is great. You, you almost feel like, you've, you feel like you're back in the 50s when you're there, to be mm -hmm. honest. It, I mean, because we, we were that way at one time. And some families still are, but I think so many have gone on the total opposite end of that at this point. Kids are eating on the floor oh, yeah. in front of the TV. Yeah. yeah. Or on the way to soccer practice or in um, the car on the way yep. to school. Yeah. But see, a lot of that is because they're these kids then are spending so much time doing homework and doing all these things, trying to just catch up 
that they are forced to eat on the run. And it's, there ha- there's a way to make these changes and bring some of these concepts back. Obviously, some of the things like that we had talked about that the kids walk themselves to and from school, you really don't see parents. And we were there at the end of some of the school days. I saw one parent at one of the schools we went to with a little, with her little, maybe four or five year old. Other than that, we didn't see parents anywhere. There's like the helicopter parent does not exist in Finland. Hmm. These kids get themselves to school. They walk themselves home from school. It's just, it was so different. Those things, obviously we can't, we can't in some areas we can't, it's not the same here. There are some places I think maybe the Midwest and maybe not necessarily South central where my school is. Most of those kids don't walk. I can't imagine a five-year-old walking home by themselves. Mm -hmm. But here, yeah, we, and you, and we, I think we hold our kids' hands too much. We were at another school, and there was a little girl who must have been four. And outside of every classroom, there's there's snowshoes, there's snow boots. They don't wear any shoes inside their schools. None of the schools in Finland, the teachers even don't wear shoes. And so you'd see their snow boots and their snow suits. And this one little girl, maybe four or so, tiny little thing, was trying to get her hat and her snow stuff in the midst of fifty to a hundred other hats and and snow suits. And she was standing on top of a bench trying to reach through. And my first instinct was to go help her. She didn't ask for help. Mm -hmm. But just instinctually, I wanted to go up there and help her and make sure she didn't fall off the bench and help her find your hat. But nobody even paid attention to her there. None of the teachers and none of the adults because she knew what to do. She was getting her hat. She was getting her boots on, getting her. And she can do it. Yeah, she could do it. Yeah. So they just, that they expect that of their kids, that they can do it. They trust that they can do it. And because of that, they do. It's, yeah, it was an amazing visit. As a parent, I'm really just, I'm really like, I mean, for you, that experience as a parent, yes. watching these little kids do things must have been just really surreal. Like, I need to change who I am as a parent with my children. Yeah. No, I do. With my, my, even coming back, my five year old, there's little things she'll ask me to do because she's used to me doing it. It's my fault because I do too much for her. Right. And no, I, I've had, I've told her no more in the last week. <laughs> Than I have probably ever because I'm like, no, you can do it. You can you can take your dish and wash it and put it in the dishwasher. And they can. They just take advantage of my 10-year-olds as well. They take advantage of it. You know, I go to Target and come back with 10 bags and I'm lugging them all in the house and they just go in. Like, no. Right. Yeah. This is your stuff too. Yeah. <laughs> come back and pick it up and help. And so, no, it's, yeah, it's definitely taught me some lessons as a parent as well. Some things, I mean, I get nervous leaving my girls alone when I'm across the street at a neighbor's house, you yeah. know. But some of those things don't translate. I mean, it's just we live in a diff- different right. area than... Yeah, you know, like your kids couldn't walk to school. I mean, that's... No, yeah. no. Even I, if I was, they were in school close to where I live in Long Beach, I still don't think I would have them walking to school. Yeah. I think I'm, I'm at the point now where I'm wondering if like my son can ride his bike home and it's like two miles. Yeah. But even you said, but it's a busy street. It is a busy street. <laughs> I yeah. don't like... Because I don't like riding on that street. That makes me nervous too. Not I think because I, of anybody, but just the traffic. It's alone. a busy street, so I think I think it would be good for like junior high yeah, to ride home. High. Just kind of build up that kind of like you said, like yeah. the confidence of like I'm grown up enough that mm-hmm. someone trusts me. Yeah, but like I think like can, can you get me some chips? Can you get me a Capri Sun? Can you get me a uh, oh yeah? You know, yeah. and it's like right. the never ending. Yeah, but I'm also now that now that I have the broken arm, I can't like open doors. So like when we were at the movie theater, I'm like you got to get the door for me, bro. I can't open the door. I have a broken arm. And and he was like, oh yeah, I'm sorry. So like just teaching him to get in the mindset yeah. of like just doing things like that, of like serving others too in the capacity of being kind of mature is like a cool parenting yes. thing that I think I never really, I need to think more conscientiously about. And I think your story is kind of I think as me. moms, it's just, it's so in- it's just instinctual. We just want to do things for them. And then yeah. you have to kind of find that fine line of when is the right time to stop, to let that start letting them do things on their own. In Finland, that's like two. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which you is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. You know where the microwave is? Push. Yeah. I mean, they, and like I was telling you the story of the man with his six-year-old son, he said, yeah, he's, he'll bring himself home today at one thirty, and he'll make himself a sandwich and do his homework. And he said, he'll do his homework, I hope. And then he'll go out and play with his neighborhood friends. And then by the time I'm home at four, we'll have dinner together. But I just, t- to imagine a six-year-old walking himself home, unlocking the door, letting himself in, making himself a sandwich. But if the six-year-old there can do it, a six-year-old here can do it. You right. Know? So, oh, absolutely. Right. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a mindset. It's a, mm-hmm. it's a mindset of 
expectation Mm -hmm. and and then when that kid is in 10th grade and decides they need to go to school 20 or 30 miles away yeah they can live on their own they can you know kind of keep their own schedule and be responsible for themselves get Mm -hmm. themselves to school obviously yeah because they value it and they let kids there drive when they turn 15 they can get like a little kind of like a scooter a vespa type scooter or some of them have these snowmobile things and then just so they can be self-sufficient to get themselves to school. So they can have that until I think they're 18. And by 18, they can actually have a real car. But not before then. They have to have these little scooters to get around town. But I mean, there's in telling the story to um, a colleague about seeing these little kids, little five-year-olds walking to and from school, the difference is here. She jokingly said, well, if that happened here, we'd be reported right. to child <laughs> services. <laughs> You know, you like there was that story of a little girl who's eight, I think, walking her dog in the neighborhood, and, yeah. and there was all this backlash that the mom received because of it. And she was just trying to Very teach. Sad. Yeah, she was trying to teach her daughter to take her dog on a walk and be mature. You know, I mean, so in, in this society, I think some of those things don't translate, but within our own home as parents, yeah, they do. We can instill some of that maturity and self awareness in our in our and own responsibility children. responsibility yes it's responsibility and I think it, it would be cool to see how how this translates to parents at your guys at the schools mm-hmm. of these principals who are going to start kind of implementing some mm-hmm. of these things and tr- piloting some of these things what some what two or three of the principals have already done I mean we just got back last Saturday so it's been a week that we've been back what they've already done in this one week that we've already been at school um, they've sent out letters to their their community. Just telling the parents, you know, look, they bringing back this word trust. You've trusted us to in, to teach your children and do what's best for your children while they're here at our school. So we ask you to just remember that, to remember that you've in, you've entrusted them with us to hire the right teachers, you know, to employ the right people to get the job done. And so just remember that that you've trusted in us, and so we'll trust in you as well. But you know, because you have parents questioning you all the time about different things and calling you out all the time different things and. So just reminding them of that. It being at the school is a choice, especially a Catholic school. That's your choice to be there. And so if you're choosing to stay here, just please trust in me to do the job properly. These letters that these two principals sent out, I thought was really inspiring that they brought that back and got right to work. I, I think both of them came because of having <laughs> some negative issues with a parent or two. And that kind of lit that fire in them. But we were all very, very inspired by this trip. And we hope... What our plan is now is to go into the diocese and maybe deanery wide and just, you know, several principals at a time or else just find a group of principals who are interested and to kind of teach them what, what we brought back and what they can instill in, in their own school and what concepts they can borrow from Finland. And then hopefully um, we're hoping to go back to visit Northern Finland and spend a time maybe just in one school system to really dive deep in their curriculum design. Because being there and te- touring a different school each day for three to four hours each day we got to see a lot and got to compare the different schools, but not to really dive deep into what they were doing in each individual school. So we're hoping to, we'll see if the archdiocese will fund that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we're trying. Or you write a grant to be there for a semester. That's where you can really get oh, kind of the data yes. and the information that yeah. you need. And the other thing too is it starts with those teachers kind of coming out of their programs in college, mm-hmm. knowing some foundational skills. And so you guys really having a thought partner in a higher ed program mm-hmm. to make sure that the teachers coming out of these higher ed programs are able to meet the the pedagogical and foundational practice needs um, that are happening, I think is really cool too. So yeah. I'm excited about hearing, you know, more and learning more about that piece of what they're doing over there and there. Yeah. I want to look more into, we got to hear a little bit, bit about their teacher education programs within the university system. It's just so much more involved than what ours is right now here. It's very research heavy. They're v- everything that they do is all research based. Mm-hmm. Interestingly enough, a lot of the research comes from the United States, but it's very research heavy. And so there's a certain assessment that these students who are applying to the program take, and they have to get a certain score. And if they get that score, then they're given 20 different research articles. And I think they're given um, maybe a month or so to study them. And then they're given an assessment and they have to respond to these research articles. And it's very, very tough to get into that. So it's a multi-step program just to be accepted into into this profession, into the education side of it. So once they get through, they have a very low turnover rate in teachers because Mm -hmm. even though the pay isn't as high as they would hope, they've worked so hard to get accepted into these programs and they're so well respected that the teachers, once they, they get into the profession, they don't rarely leave their profession and they rarely leave their school. So when they're hired onto a school, most that's their school. Hmm. They're very committed to the school who hires them. 
Well, and I think it comes down to, I mean, you said it, they're so well respected. I mean, they, the, the, it's such a rigorous program to get into and not that, not that education is, you know, easy to get into. Yeah, I mean, you, you do have to, you know, meet a lot of standards here, but it's so rigorous to get into. It's, it's so well respected mm -hmm. and there's so much trust mm -hmm. that you're not, they're not dealing with a lot of the issues that some of our teachers here are, are dealing yeah. with as far as like being questioned constantly by either administration mm -hmm. or parents or. And that made me even think about some of the things that I require my own teachers to do that, you know, I, I expect them to do lesson plans and unit plans and all these things that they have to turn into me that I check, which I've had other principals kind of scoff at that. And I thought, well, I want to see what they're teaching. I want to be, you know, which I do. So I'm kind of in the middle there. I want to see what they're teaching, but I feel like, you know, in just an overall um, pacing plan or unit plan for the year, I can see what they're teaching and not have to be, you know, such like a dictator where I'm every single week, I'm expecting them to turn it into me because I do right now. They all on right. lesson plan EDU, or, you know, or I'm sorry, plan book EDU. They're putting their lesson plans every single week and I'm making sure they're integrating standards. And so I, I made me kind of reflect on, should I just trust them? Should I just trust that they're doing what they need to do? You mm -hmm. know, should I trust that they're collaborating with their peers? And I even set collaboration time for them and and so I, I feel like I should just trust that I've hired the right people to do the job and let them, you know, have some autonomy to do what they feel is, is best suited for their students. I love hearing that you're saying that because that makes me really happy, especially because I have a relationship with their <laughs> school. But I think like hearing hearing you say like I've set collaboration time with them, I, st I still think that's important. Mm -hmm. Like I've set aside this time for you guys, you know, to work together mm -hmm. and it's sacred. And so you still have yeah. that time in their schedules that they know that that's their opportunity, but maybe they don't need it this week Yeah, or they've got some other And that's other kind of what I've on. done this year. So we, we set up a time on their elective days where they have, I mean, when I started teaching, we didn't have one period. We, our kids would go to computer lab and, you know, we'd have half the kids in class. We never had any breaks whatsoever. Now the teachers have four hour breaks and because they have coding and Spanish and PE and those things. And so I've set up a time when people who teach like subjects, so the ELA teachers get together, the math teachers get together, the science teachers. So they have collaboration time. And one, two of my teachers joked if, if they could like zoom in, <laughs> even though one's downstairs, one's upstairs, but they went out of the zoom meeting for their collaboration time. And I said, look, I don't care as long as you guys are sharing ideas. And most of those teachers, because we're departmentalized, our ELA teachers, one is a third grade teacher and one is a middle school sixth grade teacher. So even though traditionally those teachers wouldn't be sharing ideas because mm -hmm. the elementary and middle kind of stick to themselves. But now because they have that collaboration time, they are helping one another and sharing some strategies. And so it has worked. And then we also, I schedule time in for them to have a one-on-one -on -one with me. So once a week they come in and do kind of like a check-in. Sometimes they pop their head in and say, hey, do you need anything? And I say, no, do you need anything? No, okay, they leave. But sometimes they sit down I got a teacher this week that just sat down to tell me that her grandmother had a stroke. It wasn't even education related, but that was her time that she knew she could come in and sit down with me and close the door and kind of chit chat. Mm -hmm. So I do think those things are important to still to still have to still have in a schedule. Yes, but to also be like, as long as your unit plan is there mm -hmm. and I can check it mm -hmm. if I need to. Like if you're going to go in and do a walk-in observation, you could pop in and look and say, okay, this is what they're doing mm -hmm. today. This is what I'm going to be looking mm -hmm. for and. You know, an informal or formal observation. You just know that it'll be there, but you're yeah. not like, I'm going to check in on you every week, but it better be there when I do. Yeah. Like if I go in and look mm -hmm. and it's, there's nothing there for three or four weeks, then we're going to have a problem. Yeah. Right. Cause I trusted. And I don't even, you know, I, it's like the way that we were taught lesson planning when we were in, in college, that like three page lesson plan that was for one 60 minute lesson. <laughs> I don't expect anything crazy like that. They right. just tell me they're objective procedure, you know, if it's a blended lesson, they'll put in their tech rotation, they're going to be on freckle or whatever it might be. They'll tell me what they're doing for each rotation, but it's not this long scripted out thing. They should theoretically be able to do their lesson plan in like 10 minutes. Right. So I'm not expecting too much, but so there's, I kind of struggle. I go back and forth with, I want them to be autonomous, but I also want to make sure that it's getting done. It's getting done. Yeah. And the, the longer you go with knowing that it's getting done, the less you can. Oh yeah. Right My at. teachers who've been there for years, I'm like, I look at them, but you know, I'm not, I don't scrutinize them as much as I would for a brand new teacher. For the brand new teacher, I'm like, Hey, make sure you're doing this. Make sure you're integrating this standard. This standard I've seen that you've taught it multiple times. Make sure you're moving on to another standard. So, you know, I'm, I, analyze theirs much more than I would. My but that's coaching. Teachers. That's yeah. great. That's great coaching mm -hmm. too. All right. So I want to talk about tech in Finland because you said that they're, they're not maybe where we're, where your school is at or where not some of the other all. schools I are. I didn't see any like tech carts. I didn't see, I, I, I saw two girls in one sewing classroom on a computer using Google images to download 
and print pictures of things that they were going to sew onto their clothing. I really maybe I'm, I don't remember seeing any the Chromebooks or iPads or anything on desks at all or nor stored in corners of the classrooms. But I did also didn't see textbooks, which is interesting. The kids are just were just very hands on with everything that they were doing. We did see I did see some projector screens down and, the, and some kids presenting um, and some middle school areas. They were student was presenting on diseases and depression. And I don't know what the assignment was, but, you know, he had created this presentation. So they're learning it somehow. Mm-hmm. The one school did, uh, believe it or not, had, had a computer lab. Mm-hmm. Nobody was in it, but a computer <laughs> lab that looks like it had been there since probably the 90s. But no, there was very, it was much less than what I'd, I had had these visions. And even if you were to go on now and, you know, Google image Finland classrooms, you see these like really cool um, alternate seating and tech everywhere. And it's, I, I think in Northern Finland, they are much more advanced in that area. So that's why we, we do want to go and, and, and visit those schools. But where we were in, in Southern Finland, it wasn't, it, you see much more here than you, than mm-hmm. you did there. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. What, so what was the seating like? It, was it like a typical classroom that you would see here? There was there was one, there was most of the schools, what, yes, were just traditional seating. There were traditional desks in rows. There was lots of wood. There's no plastic anywhere in Finland. You just, everything's wood. So we're like in a younger kindergarten classroom here. You'd see the little plastic bin and they have all their supplies in it. Everything there's wood because they have an overabundance of wood. But it was just very, very traditional. And some of the schools, the newer schools did have flexible seating. So you would see, but even though they were traditional, you did see like those um, inflatable little round circular things that you can put on your seat. So they're like the cheaper option of having like the wiggle seats. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so we did see those. So even the schools that did have the traditional desks, they did have those or they had these little rocking things that the kids could sit on the floor and it had a little place for their their writing, like a little kind of desktop, but they could sit and rock in this little chair. So you would see little things here and there that they would bring in. The kids would kind of check out as they need them. It wasn't an entire classroom of flexible seating. But the newer school that we went to, we saw it much more there, but I think just because it was a brand new school. Um, and, then, and then there was another school we went to that had kind of these like stadium seating um, little arrangements where the kids could kind of lounge all over it and do the work. But in the halls and everything, you did see tons of um, like soft seating where the kids could be out there lounging around. That was in every school we went to. So it may have been traditional in the class. But like I said, if the kid takes an assignment and wants to go and lay in the hallway on this comfy like little lounger, then they could. They were just very relaxed. I mean, it makes it even because they had no shoes on. The kids are just very relaxed. Right. Everyone's chewing gum. Like they have no, there's not a no gum rule there at all. Literally every child you would see had gum in their mouth, but they were trusted again not right. to put it places where it shouldn't be. But then the shoe option, this shoe thing was an interesting thing too. I don't know if it's just because of the snow boots and the, the mess that it makes, you know, with them going in and out because there's gravel and dirt everywhere. But obviously in the spring and summer, they're still not wearing their shoes, but it makes the kids more relaxed. You'll see the kids sitting crisscross in their seat and, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, and keeps the school much cleaner. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and the other thing we saw at every single school was taxidermy everywhere. Uh, really? I've never seen so much taxidermy <laughs> ever. <laughs> every school. And I don't mean like one or two pieces, like thousands of stuff. Really? Animals. <laughs> yes. Oh and so we, we started noticing it. Not, not, no kidding. We saw five schools and every single school had this like hallway of glass cases with taxidermy animals everywhere. And some had little statues next to each animal to say what, what they were. And, and I asked someone finally, what is this about? Why, why is there these stuffed animals everywhere? And she said, because it's, it shows the history of the school. So every school, I guess, back in the 40s, 50s, it was a big thing. Taxidermy was a big thing in Europe. And so every school had that for some reason. It was a way for the kids to learn about the animals, I guess. And so they've kept it to be true to the mm. history of their school. So they all have these hallways of dead stuffed animals. Wow. And are, are they like native animals? Most of them are. Yeah, okay. they're native to the area. Like there was this one bird that we saw the first day we were in Helsinki. And I said, look, there it is. So I learned what the, you know, I don't remember what the bird was called now, but that, that they, it's all native to the, their area. area. Yeah. Interesting. But just part of the history of the school. And I think they're just so used to seeing it that it was, it's something they just walk by every day. But when I asked, cause, oh yeah, yeah. I think they forget that it's there. Wow. That's interesting. <laughs> it was very interesting. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and there, the, the other thing, the teacher's lounges, they talked about that. We learned about that before going, that the teachers would really hang out. It was a great, comfortable space for them to be. And that, that was true. The teachers had their classrooms, but at most schools, they had a big working area. So like at one of the schools, they had a big table 
and each teacher like, would share with another teacher. And that was where all the teacher did their work. They So they would come together in a shared space to do their lesson plans and grading. And you would just see these tables just covered in students' papers and computers all over the place. And like one school had these really cool like donut looking couches and, and the teachers were actually in there. Like we have our teacher's lounge, but the teachers all hang out either in their classrooms or in my office. Like they, I don't know why, but, and I've put couches and things to make it a more comfortable space, but no one really hangs out there, but there they do. They all hang out together, Hmm. but it's kind of part of their culture. And it's, and in teach like Finland in his book, he talks about that, that when he first started working in Finland, having come from the States, he would just stay in his classroom during breaks, during recess and lunch. He'd, and they look at him like, you need to take time for yourself. You need, just like the kids need breaks, brain mm-hmm. breaks, you need it as well. Mm-hmm. So they really encourage the staff to come together and to spend their time, even if it's just chit-chatting, not necessarily doing work, but to take advantage of those breaks. Mm-hmm. So they really value their life. It's not just all about working. Now, does their school year is the same as yeah, ours? Yeah, they um, basically are off July and August. And so, the, yeah, they're in school 10 months. So it's pretty similar. So yeah, it's great. We all want to, we can all move together. Let's do it. Yeah, I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. As long as you don't mind the cold. I loved it. You, As long as you're dressed properly, you have to have good shoes. You're not slipping all over the place. Right. You dress properly and have enough layers. That's what one of the one of the women told us from the university the first day. Just as long as you wear enough layers, you'll be fine. Yeah. And the summers are like 75 and beautiful. Yeah. And like the, the fact that there's lakes everywhere. They call it every man's land. So basically... Every it's every man's land that you could camp anywhere you want to go. There's no specified camping areas. And so they, you have to take out a permit to have a fire, but you don't need any kind of permit for camping or using the land. And then in areas that are more populated f- for camping, um, they have these little areas set up where it's like a raised wood foundation. So they didn't have to camp on the snow. And then there's a little um, shed that's stocked with wood from the government and a, um, a stump and an ax. Wow. Hmm. That they just leave out there for anybody who wants to use it. Wow. And a little um, cooking area for barbecues. <laughs> Can you imagine everything. just leaving an axe in the middle <laughs> of a, like Yosemite? Like just, <laughs> just, it's just so different. Yeah. It's so different. Amazing. What an opportunity. Right. It was a great opportunity. What? I don't think I could ever learn the language. We met a, a, a man, one of the teachers at the international school, and he was from England. And he's been there 22 years. And he's like, no, I still don't know the language. It's a very interesting language. Even Swedes who are right next door. We met a guy who said, I still don't know it. You know, it's, it's a very, inter- very unique mm-hmm. language. We learned how to say cheers <laughs> and <laughs> hi and bye. Thank you. Like it's very simple things, but. So how do they go about learning all these languages? The, the, we went we were in a class uh, for an English course and it was interesting. The kids were, le- they were reading a book and it was for, it was a ninth grade class it was about get, getting college acceptance letters. So they were reading this whole um, lesson in English. It's very similar to what we do here, the, what, what it seemed like, what their texts look like, but um, it's just more of it. Mm. So where here the kids may have, they start later. But the interesting there too, they start later. They don't start the language earlier. They're now starting to change that. They're starting the language earlier when they're young, which obviously studies have shown that that's, that's the, brain. The, the best time mm-hmm. for them to learn. But the kids... It, or like I said, I get a minimum of two hours a week. And I think um, just because they focus on it so heavily and that's that, such an important concept for them, it's the teachers who are teaching that. It's not like you just have a, a, your regular core teacher. Oh, I'm going to teach Spanish to you today. Like they, these are teachers who specialize in that language and that's all they teach for those particular students. So well, one of the schools we went into was a Spanish course. So we felt like, thank goodness, we can actually understand something that's being said because most of us spoke Spanish. And her Spanish was beautiful. I mean, she was a Finnish woman, but he, she specialized and 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 studied that language in college. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, th- so th- there's there's much more intention to what they're doing and those who are teaching the subject. It's not like you just hire anybody off the street who happens to be able to speak that language. Yeah, you have to be able to not only speak the language but teach. Yes, the language. A very different concept. Mm-hmm. I think it's just part of the culture all over Europe that they learn multiple languages. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So I, that's just kind of innate in who they are and what they what they do. So it, like I, anywhere we went, there's everybody spoke English. And I was at a grocery store one day and the guy, I walked past one of the employees and he said, hey, which is how they say hi. He said, hey, and I just naturally said hi back. And then we got to the cash register and he just started speaking to me in English. And I said, why aren't you speaking to me in Finnish? How do you, why do you assume I don't speak Finnish? And he said, because when I said hi, you said, hey. <laughs> I mean, he said, I'm sorry. When I said, hey, you said hi. I said, oh, that's, that's right. I guess so. But- but no, they, I know. <laughs> they were so kind, though. They they were such sweet people. Everyone was, yeah. 
They said that's that their downfall. They're actually too polite. Too nice. One of the guys said, you know, if I was driving with my wife in the car and she wasn't driving properly, if she was driving and I was a passenger, she wasn't driving properly, it would be considered extremely rude for me to correct her on her driving. Like that they're too polite, that they're, they'll over apologize for the weather. Like when visitors come, I'm so, so sorry. <laughs> the weather's so bad that, and everyone did say that to us. Oh, you came and it's like winter, but it's not really usually like this. They're over apologetic. And so one of the guys we met from there said that he kind of wished that would change a little bit, but I feel that if they did, they would go too far to the other side. Yeah. So I think they kind of need to keep that as part of who they are. Mm-hmm. So what kind of things are you going to bring back to your school to, to I already implement? worked on it there. They laughed at me because one of the days we were, we were, um, at a school that specializes in the special ed, which is another interesting w- thing that they do that I can get back to, but I already started making my schedule. So I'm definitely going to implement the 90 minute instruction, 30 minute recess. So I plan to have a 30 minute recess in the morning, then have our lunch break, which we normally do 40 minutes and then a 30 minute recess in the afternoon. Um, and it, I, I, for me, schedule wise, I just had to make sure that those minutes would work out and it still does. So I definitely plan to do that. The homework, lessening the amount of homework that we're, that we're doing. Um, and then instilling again, like, especially with middle school, that trust aspect that if they really feel that they got it, then we're not going to do busy work. We're getting rid of that. And we, we eliminated that before. Like we don't do the traditional spelling 10 words a week and they write them five times each. I mean, we, we eliminated a lot of those kind of things, traditional things, um, a few years back. And then bringing in a lot of these vocational skills. So that's going to be probably the most difficult thing for me to do and to get funded. But I feel with at one of the schools in the Northern Finland, we, the principal, his, his kids, they got a grant to do some improvements to their school. So they rotate funds between schools every few years. And so he had his kids do all of it. So when they got this money in, he wanted to repaint the school and build benches. The kids built everything and did everything. They painted the school, Wow! really made it theirs. So one of the things that they built was these, um, they, he called them nests and they made them out of um, pallets. And so they took pallets and these kids themselves built these little study nests that he has all over his school with pillows. And so if the kids want to go in there and work and do their homework in there or go in and take a nap in there. And so I talked to him, asked if he can give me the specs so we could, that's something I can start with woodwork. That's, I don't need these fancy woodwork studios. And we're in an area where there's pallets everywhere, downtown LA. Right. So get some of these, these pallets and find a handy parent to come in and who, whichever class that semester is working on, they'll build the, the nest. So that will be the fifth grade nest or the seventh grade nest or whoever's working on it. And then for cooking, just get some of my parents who are skilled yeah, chefs, you have, have them come in. Yeah, you have those resources. Yeah, yeah. and we have mm-hmm. a kitchen that we the kids could use to cook and sewing. So I'm just so I plan to bring back and that I'm gonna. I already worked on a schedule. I'm gonna integrate that into our our kind of elective day. So the kids will still have Spanish and music and drama and what they have now, and then they'll rotate through these vocational classes. I was even thinking like that's an opportunity for a makerspace. Like mm-hmm. makerspace could encompass where you would put woodworking oh, and totally. wood, you know, other kinds of um, cooking and yeah. all, all the other things could go into a makerspace type totally. of sewing yeah. could all be part of that space that. Yeah. Well, we have a classroom right now that the Shays built for us that we use as like a daycare class. During the day, it's not being used. Our mm. counselors use it, but there's two people in there using it. So I can move them somewhere and use that classroom during that time. Yeah. Or just, I mean, we'll be outside. We'll do it wherever we have to do it really. We have the Shays coming to do some work this summer. And I said, you guys are lucky that you didn't, I didn't apply for this after my trip because <laughs> my list of requests would have been much bigger than what I had asked for because yeah, to have even just a little, like a studio for the kids to do these kind of projects in would be great. But yeah, we're limited on space. Our school's so small. Yeah. But yeah, those are the main things I, I, I plan to start with. And then this whole trust concept where, you know, I'm going to eliminate the whole bathroom pass thing. Like, you know, mm-hmm. kids have to go to the bathroom, get up and go to the bathroom. I would like to bring back the shoe, the shoe idea of having mm-hmm. the kids not wear shoes, but I don't know. I have to kind of play around with that idea. I don't know what the, how the, my pastor would feel having random shoes all over the hallway. <laughs> but um, and then and then the, with regards to the special education, they're all completely mainstreamed. Kids are totally mainstreamed within the classroom. And then I, we were in one class one day, and there was two teachers, and I asked one of them, "Are you team teachers? Why are there why are there two of you in here?" And she goes, "No, I'm a special teacher. They don't say special ed." I'm a special teacher and I'm here to work with one, one of the students. But the interesting thing is, is that student doesn't know who he or she is. So she's, even though she's there specifically to work with one student who has, who has some significant needs, she works with all the kids. So if, she, if she's helping the student with, let's say a math worksheet, and there's some other kids that are raising their hand, she goes between all of them. And so she's there on Monday. So the kids just kind of look at her as an aid that's there on Mondays. They have that particular child who needs the extra help, has no idea who he or she is. 
Hmm. So that just, sounds like our our freckle interview with Sarah right. Emerling. That's she, but she's is, there every every day. She's there every day. Yeah. Right. So she has she's an, has an opportunity to really be a co teacher with those. But, but yeah, that's, that's such a, an interesting concept. And yeah. that's when we met. We went to a school that had a pretty um, big population of students who who had special needs, and so there was a teacher, and basically uh, he's the kind of the special ed teacher, and. When, when a teacher is having some tr- trouble with one of their students focusing or whatever it might be, he brings that student in and works with them individually. And then his job is to try to get that child back into the classroom or he may just take them for a few hours a day. Some kids, he says that he has them all day long and even goes on field trips with the, that student. But the main goal is to get that child back into the classroom full time and he'll just be there to support the teacher. And we kind of joked with him and said, well, you know, do some teachers take advantage of that? Like those difficult students... Are they going to keep pushing for them to be with you all day, every day? And he said, no, they know that the goal is to get them back into class. They know mm-hmm. that. So they can try all they want, but they know that's not how it works. Hmm. So it's just a very different that there's no special day class. There's no special ed, none of that. And the teachers, are the teachers trained in like really understanding the psychology behind working with special needs I'm not kids sure. Or, we didn't yeah. look into that. I'm sure that they are, but every school has within this one school that we went to and they had about a thousand students. He was one of six special like special teachers Hmm. so they have a heavy staff of those who are specifically skilled in that area and then the teachers send those either come to them for assistance or they push in or pull out yeah Hmm. exactly interesting but i knowing how their education preparation is i guarantee there's a lot there with special working with kids with special needs we saw a few that you know had um that had like a a wheelchair or Mm -hmm. walkers and things like that but yeah, it was hard to tell who was who because they were all just mainstream yeah. together. So the obvious, the the physical, uh, those those students ones were out. easier to yeah. identify, but the other ones that are not as obvious. And then they had they had classrooms that we were similar to what we call like our Title One. So then we had, but the interesting thing is the kids submit bring themselves to those classes. So we we met two teachers, one with, that works specifically with ELA and one with math. And they were working with small groups of kids. And then there was another room off to the side where this girl was just kind of lounging on the ground. And these middle schoolers, if they were struggling in something, they would self-refer and they would say, hey, I need help with this. And then so during their normal math period, let's say for math, they'll be in this small setting with this math teacher and, and maybe two or three other students. And they just work with them, but they self-refer. If there's some students that don't refer, the teachers can refer them out too, but but it's interesting that the kids themselves can choose to go and work in this smaller setting. And then when this girl that was lounging in the other classroom, I said, who is that? Like, why is she here? Oh, she just probably needs a break. She didn't, they didn't know why she was there. She was just <laughs> laying on the floor. She, oh, she's just probably relaxing and needs a break. Just wanted to step out of her class. Wow. Yeah. And then there's a, a, a new, and I've been hearing more about this. We didn't hear a ton of it there, but they had this anti, we asked about bullying and said, is bullying a big problem? What, mm-hmm. what happens with bullying or, you know, um, Online bullying, and they just, they again looked at me like that was a silly question. <laughs> and they said, no, it just doesn't happen. And I said, what do you mean it doesn't happen? And she said, no, it doesn't happen. It's a zero tolerance, completely zero tolerance. So they have, they instituted a program, I think it's called Kiva, K I V A. And a lot of other um, countries have began using it as well. And it's kind of a, it's a method of stopping it before it starts hmm. and, and working to really identify who these bullies are and going to the bully and trying to kind of figure out what's causing it. And, and so, um, and fi- really trying to figure out what's where where it's rooted in and how you can help that child to eliminate any further bullying to happen. And so there's posters all over the school that you'll the schools you'll see about identifying if someone's being bullied or someone's alone, how you can um, how you can react, how you can engage that student, and and so it's really um, a really interesting concept in the way that they're addressing bullying. And I just said, what about what about digital bullying? Like you know, I said you guys use Instagram or Snapchat. Mm-hmm. And she's, I said, I asking these two girls who are, I think, ninth, ninth, eighth and ninth grade. Okay, so what if you said something negative about her on Snapchat? Like, and she goes, no, it just doesn't happen. Like, they're shunned if that happens. Like, it just does not happen. Because they're all nice. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're like overly <laughs> yes, nice. Yes. <laughs> Maybe that's why. Wow. But yeah, it just doesn't happen because he knows there's a zero tolerance. Like, it just doesn't happen. Huh. So I want to, I plan to look more into that Kiva program and they have it in English. So it, it sounds really interesting. That's cool. I, I, I'm super excited to see kind of how this manifests itself, not only at your school, but kind of where the other schools that yeah. across the, the diocese and how they continue to support that, that initiative. Mm-hmm. Because traditionally, American education is slow yes. to change and adopt. And I think it's really cool that the LA Archdiocese has kind of put this 
think tank group together mm-hmm. and picked, I think, you know, knowing some of the folks that I know, kind of some of the people who will initiate change mm-hmm. and spark and light some fires among their their groups of folks. And I'm really, I'm, I'm really excited about this. Yeah, we all came back. So, I mean, we were excited just going there, but we came back just on fire. So excited to, so ne- we, we we're going to have a principals meeting in April. And so we're going to briefly speak to all the principals about there and then kind of see how, how we choose to, to spread the good word. <laughs> and you guys committed to like another year of yeah. like planning PDs and working and, yes. and yeah. so cool. So we're just really hoping that they'd be, like I said, that we could get back and to kind of dive deeper into an individual school, especially I was really interested in the, in the, the more um, tech, advanced school mm-hmm, mm-hmm. in northern uh finland i'll tag along with you on that yes for sure <laughs> <laughs> i gotta wait till next year <laughs> so you would know the questions to ask i'm really interested too like i said about uh, learning about the teacher preparation the university level mm-hmm. i'm really interested to learn more about that yeah because i think that's where the change would begin too with us here is really i think it has to begin yeah. i think that that it is you know it's kind of a both and right like mm-hmm. you, you really need to we need to make changes out in the field right now, but we also have to create systemic change from within um, at the university level. Yeah. And so, yes, I think it's... But at the same time, I mean, there to be hired as a teacher, you have to have a master's degree. And so these people have spent a, a lot of time on their education and a lot of... Well, it's free, so they're not paying for the education, but they have that respect there, which makes people want to work that hard mm-hmm. to get accepted mm-hmm. to these programs. We're here. There's such a high turnover rate in teaching because you work so hard. Mm-hmm. And they said, look, it's the same there. These teachers go home and do more work at home and are spending hours upon hours and spending tons of money doing things for the classroom. And it's very similar there. Mm-hmm. It's it's interesting because it does seem very similar. Uh, there's a lot of similarities to Catholic schools, believe it or not, because even when they, the principal talked about what they did, that they pretty much have to do everything. That they have a you know APs and vice principals, but they're really doing everything. And I said, well, that's what we do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I mean, for pretty much the same amount of pay, the principals aren't paid a huge sum either. Like a traditional pr- principal makes, I think, fifty nine hundred euros a month. So that is about maybe sixty one, sixty two hundred mm-hmm. here so, a month. So, yeah, they're but they don't. But they're probably not coming out with eighty or a hundred thousand no. dollars worth of debt out of no. college, and they're not like, and they're respected. Mm-hmm. And I think that's that's really hard because here in the United States, it, we're traditionally teachers and principals are traditionally not as respected in their field. True. For some reason, mm-hmm. parents who come out of different industry feel like they know better on how to educate their kids. And yeah. you've had these conversations. I've had these conversations as an educator, and you're like, oh, I'm sorry, all that work I did and studying I did about understanding your child's brain. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You're right. I don't know you. <laughs> I think a lot of that has to do too with the location of your school. My school being an inner city school, we're very well respected. The yes. teachers are respected. The, the, it's culture though. It's definitely. It's cultural. Right. Because you're serving a different demographic. Totally. Than kind of some of the other schools that you went more to. More affluent schools. Yes. Yeah. More yeah. affluent schools. I think you're having different conversations. Yes. But then in your schools, like they can't afford to they can't afford to compensate you guys and, you know, pay full tuition or things like yeah. that. And so they you have a lot of a high volunteer rate, right? Yes. I know that oh your, my gosh, your yeah. parents, parents are so are, involved, yes. and, uh, which is also almost the flip side sometimes in the affluent spaces is you don't get that as much. It's yeah. just very, it's, it's just, we're, American education system is broken <laughs> and, yeah. um, and you guys are making, I think, a really nice pilot of change. Yes. It's interesting, though, even amongst the principals that that came together for this trip, because demographically, some are from the Valley. I mean, they're from all over the place, some Thousand Oaks. And and, in my eyes, when I started making these these schedules and all these changes, and they're looking at me like, really, you're going to do all this next year? Well, your your parents are, there's not going to be like an uproar? No. My parents, I mean, I feel like we do have that trust in the school. The parents Mm -hmm. really do trust us. And if I say, hey, we're going to I'm going to start having your, I think the one thing I'm kind of concerned about is some of the fathers may not like me having some of their boys sewing. Right. So that I think I'm going to have to kind of break some gender stereotypes there. But I think they really just are fine with any changes that we make. When we decided to take away a lesson homework, there there was a complaint here or there. Um, But other than that, they're just very supportive in what we do as a school. So I think that I'm, I'm fortunate to be where I am with, with wanting to implement and do so many big changes. Because some of the schools, I don't think the parents would be as receptive to that. As long as you approach it the right way. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, like one of the principals I went with, some big actor, I don't remember which actor was, just enrolled his child there. And that's the kind of, that's the demographics of who he serves. Mm -hmm. And so obviously these parents are going to hold him a little bit more accountable. 
But I said, look, we went and we, we were there for a week and we studied this system and see how well it's working. And so why not try some of these things? Even if we just pilot. So we even talked about amongst our group piloting different things. Like one of us can maybe pilot mm-hmm. and just try like the vocational skills. One mm-hmm. can just pilot and try the extra recess and then really study and get some data from that and see how it's, because we can easily track that and see how the students are performing now with less frequent breaks in comparison to after maybe three months of having these frequent breaks if they're if they're performing better. Right. And yeah. I know that a lot of schools also do little pilot programs for the, like the two weeks before school gets out. Yes. Just to try it right That's before. It's kind of a downtime anyways. Right, yeah. exactly. Good time to, to test some of these programs. Yeah. No, I plan, I mean, I, I plan to kind of try it all out. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I have, like I said, I have the support of my, I have a very supportive teaching staff. I don't have a lot of turnover with my teachers. And so they're, I'm encouraging them. There's some grant funds out right now that the diocese is allowing teachers or principals to use from now until um, December it, to go anywhere. And so I'm encouraging some of my teachers to go, and just because because they see it through me, and I get I get so excited with them and try to light that fire in them. But I feel like if they get there and are immersed in this culture and in these schools and see how exciting it is, I think they're going to come back and just be yes, we have ready to do this. for change. Yeah. Yes, yeah. No, I think that's amazing. And then they're going to come back with seeing different things than you did. Totally, because they're going to look at things from a teacher's perspective. Exactly. That's so cool. Mm-hmm. Oh, I was just going to ask you, too, about the Finnish schools as far as lunch. Do they have uh, the school supplies their lunch? Yeah. The kids do not bring lunches to school. Yeah. yeah. So the food, every child is given. And it's good. We ate at some of the schools. And every school supplies the meals for free for every single student. And it's a hot lunch. Yeah. yeah, so we were at one, and it's very, they're very methodical about how they do everything. So even the way that they get their food, when they're done eating, it took us a minute to kind of understand how it worked. Um, but, you know, you have your little tray of food, and when you're done, you have to go to one certain trash can, empty the food, another trash can, empty the trash. And then there's one spot where you put the cup upside down. There's another place where you have to put the tray, and it's very organized. And even the youngest kids, I mean, I watched one little boy walk with his tray, and it looked like a, a glass and the principal, I said, oh my gosh, you guys let you guys trust them that much? You give this like four-year-old, three-year-old a glass cup? She goes, no, 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 it's plastic. But even this little three-year-old, four-year-old, however old he was, got done eating, picked up his tray, quietly walked over, put everything in its spot, and then went out and played. And they're talk- and, and that's another thing we noticed is how quiet their lunchroom was. Like we were in awe. Of, and I don't know what they – they're just quieter people. But they, the kids sit and they just talk and they use their indoor voices and they – but they're, they're, I don't know, my lunchroom, it seems much more chaotic than mm-hmm. their <laughs> lunchrooms do. Our students, maybe because our kids aren't getting their energy out, you know? Yeah, so when right. they come to lunch, they have all this energy to get out. But the kids were just very calm and responsible for their own food and getting their food and eating and taking it and throwing it away and putting everything in its place. Yeah, I saw a uh, program on the Japanese schools and it's very similar. Although they actually bring the food to the classrooms mm, on carts. And they eat, in, they class. eat in the classroom, and then after they clean up the classroom afterwards. They clean their own classes. They there clean too. their yeah, own I've classrooms. Seen that. Yeah, mop and everything. Yep, it's really interesting. Yeah, there were some things that I heard and read about Finland, like they that they always have their windows open, that they believe in fresh air, and I thought, gosh, I'm going to suffer. There. I'm going to be freezing. That wasn't true. That they have these beautiful fireplaces in the schools, and they would sit in their lunchroom next to a fire. I didn't see that anywhere. <laughs> so there was a lot of things that I think are- That might be one school. Yes, right? <laughs> they were over-exaggerated. And two, the, the man who wrote the book that we studied before going, he's an American who went there, so he's teaching at an international school. Oh, okay. So the international schools are different as well. So people have to remember that reading that book, that that comes from that, the perspective Lens. of someone from an international school. They don't allow, you can't work or teach in a Finnish school unless you speak Finnish. Unless you're teaching at an international school or you're, let's say, the, like the guy we met that was the, the English teacher um, and he didn't speak any Finnish. But other than that, they, you can't work there unless you speak Finnish. Mm-hmm. So that's why this guy's perspective was a little bit different mm-hmm. in the Teach Like Finland book. There were a lot of things that we did see, but there was a lot that I thought, I haven't seen a fireplace. And you're right. I thought, wow, that sounds amazing. Like he said that they had tablecloths and flowers on each table and a fireplace. <laughs> I don't know where he's working, but yeah. I didn't see that. Super cool. So we definitely want to recommend the book. Yes, um, Teach Like Finland. Teach Like Finland. It is. It was a great read. It was a great, great book to prepare us for our, our visit. And you had already read this book before. 
Well, I had done a ton of research on my own before, but as a group, our um, Ryan, who led our group, who's our leadership for this this trip, and this was really all his idea in getting the Archdiocese to fund this trip. So we're so grateful for him. But he had this book, and he had read it, and and um, encouraged all of, of us to read the book as well before going. So so we read. The, so, but I had done other research and read other things prior to that. So, Teach Like Finland is by Timothy D. Walker. Yes, and it's a pretty new book, actually. There's so many fi- Finnish books out there and so many but um, about fi- Finnish education, but his was a great perspective, especially because coming from teaching and working education in the United States, that was a great, it was a great read because we could, you could connect to so much of what he was saying, the differences from coming from the States and being there. Like the fact that you never want to leave your classroom for recess or lunch, you got to just keep working, working, working. And we, as teachers here, feel like if you're the first one out of the door, you're the least committed. And there, that's not at all true. You know, here you have teachers staying until five, six, and you're kind of pushing them out the door. There, there, they, they, everyone leaves right when the school. As soon as their kids are out, they're gone mm-hmm. because they value their own personal time. And they, that doesn't, not to say they're not still working, but they want to be in their home working right. with their yeah. family. So they're, they're much more focused on living their life and enjoying their life. It's not just all focused on work, work, work. work. Wow, that's great. Any other books that you'd like to recommend that have made an impact? Oh my goodness. I, well, I just finished my admin program through LMU. So I haven't just been all curricular books. I'm like, I'm so ready to read. This was the first read since that, that was, there was more something of my choice, not something necessarily forced on me. <laughs> <laughs> so I know I've been kind of um, anti um, uh, reading at this moment, just because I've been, been, that's all I've been doing for the last two and a half years in my admin program through LMU. So this has been the only my most recent read. I uh there there was a um Killing Lincoln book. That's a great read. That's, that was just oh, a fun yeah. read. <laughs> I don't know that um those those whole series. Have you read those yeah. series? Those whole series are great. That's the only one I've read. The Lincoln? Yeah. The John F. Kennedy one is even better. Oh really? Yeah, Killing Kennedy. That's very interesting. Look at his life and yeah, his implications on the government. It, it's a really, really interesting read. If you like the Lincoln one, I would definitely I recommend the Kennedy. These are the Bill O'Reilly books? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So he has a huge series, but definitely, yeah, the Kennedy was, I don't know, I've just always been very enthralled with the Kennedys. Yeah, me too. And so that was, yeah, I would re- I would recommend that to be your next read. Okay. I pulled it up on my Amazon cart. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. What else, Brenda? Do you have any last think, questions? No, I think we're good. I am, I am, like Re- I said, ready to, I already packed my bags. Yeah. I'm like ready to go on the next trip. Yeah. I, I feel like I'm just so I'm like so excited to see how you guys kind of take yeah. those those pieces that you're going to bring back and go next year and and see what like everyone else is going to do. I'm just so mm-hmm. I'm so fascinated with that because I think there are things that you like like things that you just said are really quick and easy things to just pivot just a little bit mm-hmm. to to make an impact. And then the research, I'm I'm actually really interested in the research component of how you guys are going to be studying like whether the additional time in recess is going to make a difference and yeah. and whether there are other variables that might be at play there in your school too. So I'm curious to see how that plays out. Yeah, but. next year should be an interesting school year once you've get, gotten some of these things in place and seeing the impact that it has. Yeah. On the students over I think just the overall community, this sense of trust that I really want to, I feel that we do have that, but mm-hmm. I, I feel like we need to instill more of that in our parents, just trusting in what we're doing and trusting who we are and trusting that they made the right decision to have their kids in our school because yeah. it is their decision, especially at a Catholic school. Right. And so, um, but I think we, we, there was some scrutiny in, in this whole pilot and this whole group going because they felt like we just demographically were so different than, than the Finns and that how could that translate to what we're doing here and how is that going to have an impact on what we're doing in, in our own school systems? Mm-hmm. But like I said, there's so there is so much that we can bring back. So yeah. many simple things, yeah, that well, we can bring back. That's what I'm thinking. Like it's this doesn't it shouldn't matter. They're all kids. Mm-hmm. <laughs> These are just they're Finnish kids or yeah, American kids, kids or just they're just kids. So it shouldn't it shouldn't be demographics really related. There's going to be some things that are obviously yeah. going to impact that. But like the, the changes that you're making are supporting student learning. Yes, student yeah. growth, student holistic. They're, it's really the true definition of the whole child. They yeah. are educating the whole child. And so, yeah, and we're doing, trying to do the same thing here. We say that all the time. Yeah, that's what, that's what Catholic schools are really about. Yeah. I think, I mean, that's at the crux of everything. We say that in every single mission statement. 
I'm excited. I, I thank you for coming in today and thank you for telling us about your amazing journey. I'm a little jealous and yet so excited for what's going to, what's next, yes. what's coming down the pipe. The, the comp, uh, the, I'll recommend the company if anyone is interested in doing a trip like this. They do take, they took our group, but it, within our group, there's three additional um, principals, one from South Africa, one from Pittsburgh, one from near Sicily. And so they were there to study as well, just as individuals. Oh. So if it, the company is called Learning Scoop. So Learning Scoop is based out of Tampere, Finland, and they, they develop these trips um, and these study tours, um, which they, they help you with tra- transportation and um, w- with your hotel, everything. And so if anyone is interested in doing something similar, they can look into Learning Scoop. And um, they have a variety of d- different trips, which are focused. Ours is focused, obviously, from the administrator's lens, but they have some that are focused just on early childhood education, some that are just focused on the overall teaching lens. So um, whatever whatever anyone in education is really looking for, they have a learning study group for mm-hmm. that. Wow. That sounds awesome. Learning Scoop. I know. Scoop. Feel free to sponsor this podcast, Learning <laughs> Scoop. <laughs> <laughs> we are not... We are shameless. <laughs> we will take your money. They can sponsor a return trip yes, for you. That's to right. You to I w- continue talking about the great things that I would love to. I would love to. And just the, the impact that, that we could have. Yeah, we'd love to go to yeah. Finland. We could be the official podcast of <laughs> Finland. Yes. Finland School education. education. <laughs> hey, the arts, maybe we can get the Archdiocese to support you guys. And they wanted us to be all, all over Twitter and everything talking about what we were doing the whole time. So what better way to... Brenda, there you go. are you free? Are I you am. free sometime I am. next year? <laughs> hey, the Arctic tour, that's the next one we want to go on with Learning Scoop and that's next February. So we'll try to... Oh, what a birthday trip for me. There you go. Yes. We've what? been looking. Arctic tour. It's going to be freezing. Yes. yes. That's okay. It's called February. Arctic tour for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> then you'll get a real taste for if you uh, yeah. live there. Yeah, and I'll be like, hmm, maybe I'll just consult from afar. <laughs> I'll zoom it in. Stay on the cold and the blood sausage. and I'll, We'll try anything. I didn't see any of the weird fish that everyone had warned me about. They talked oh. about this like pickled fish. Yeah. I don't know. Oh. I didn't see that. Like herring? No. It's, it, it, it's, it's like a really sour, stinky. Yeah. It's like fermented. Fermented mm-hmm. fish. I know, what, I know what you're talking about. No, we didn't see that. They probably don't serve that to. There was cricket. They want crickets. you to come back. I don't know what the deal was with, with crickets. We were at a we were out one evening and there was a little dispenser of nuts and so we got some for our table and to discover that there was crickets in it. Crickets in your nuts. Cricket nuts. Mm-hmm. Cricket nuts. Cricket nuts. <laughs> I'm nuts gonna pass. With, I'm gonna pass crickets. on that. <laughs> <laughs> and then another place we had cricket pizza, but it wasn't bad. It's just salty and crunchy. Interesting. Yeah, it but is. it's a great source of protein. Yes, that's what yeah. I've heard. Yeah. yeah, I'll just bring my own nuts. I think I'll just <laughs> I'll just swing by Trader Joe's on the way in. <laughs> they did not have Diet Coke there. That was really oh, difficult for me. Really, being the uh, maybe we can get Diet Coke sponsor this. Podcast. Okay, yeah. <laughs> but being a di- Diet Coke fanatic, that was that was tough, and it's not and not great, super great coffee. But they have Coca Cola Light because they're um, and in uh, several European countries they can't say diet because then there's it's false advertisement that it will make you lose weight right it's a diet product so they can't say diet coke so it's coke zero but it's not the same Mm-mm. interesting when in finland i'm yeah. i'm super excited about whatever's next yeah me too this. and i'm impressed that you were able to go with a nice group of people from the it, archdiocese yeah, we I had think such a really, great time together yeah. yeah it was it was i think it's great going in a group like that because yeah. we're more powerful we're more likely to create change and encourage others too if we have this big group of people who didn't really know each other that it just came together because we were all so um, inspired by what they were doing in Finland. And so I think having a large number of us to inspire others, I think we're going to be more successful. That's awesome. Together. I can't wait to see what changes. Yeah. I, yeah. We don't know how we're going to really, the next year is, we, is uh, unknown to all of us how this is going to kind of fan out, but going to be exciting. So is it going to be the same group? The same goes? group that we're, well, for the next year, we're just going to be really working on just spreading the word of everything that we've, we saw and encountered there um, to the other principals. So um, next week, the leadership group is going to meet with the diocese to ask them really, because they funded the trip, how they want us to now get the word out to the other principals, whether we go to deaneries and just small groups of principals or address the entire group of principals, or just find out, you know, through a survey who's interested in learning more and and meet with those individuals. So that's kind of still all up in the air, but we've committed to a whole nother year of continuing to study about this and um, PDs and 
And then with the hopes of possibly going back. They never promised that. We're just hoping. Right. We, with the, from the moment we got on the airplane to leave, we were hoping to come back. So we'll see. Yeah. Good Hopefully. goals. Good goals. <laughs> let's, try, let's, try to, let's try to grant. Let's do it. Why not? <laughs> Hashtag big fan. Hashtag big fan. <laughs> Take your podcast team with you. That's right. We'll, 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 <laughs> we'll tweet be there. and live stream. Right. And Absolutely. Yeah. We're good tweeters. We, we, Instagram. Instagrams, we're, Facebooks. We're all over the place. We're all, we're all there. Excellent. Well, thank you for coming down yes. today and, and yes. thank you for the time and sharing. And, and maybe in a year you'll come back and tell us what, what else is up and the new things that yeah. are happening. Yeah. In Northern Finland. In Northern Finland. Finland. Yes. And just and kind of what's been happening within the within that pilot group too. I'm I'm really excited to kind of hear how that all flushes out. And yeah, once I get some data, I'm really interested in tracking, like I said, the data to see the impact of this extra playtime, recess time for the students, if that's going to impact their learning. Yeah, I think it'll be great. Me too. All right. Okay. Well, thank, thank you, you so, thank you. so much. Yeah, thank it's you. Been, it's been fun. It's been fun. I'm excited. And um, with that, we're, we're out. out. Thanks for listening to the My Tech Tool Belt podcast. If you have enjoyed listening, please rate us on Apple Podcasts or send us some feedback on our website, mytechtoolbelt.com. We would love to hear from you. This will help us deliver the content that you want to hear. Thanks. And we're out.